Okay, in chapter 25, we're going to start looking at the plant kingdom. Uh, seedless plants is chapter 25, although we will start looking in chapter 25 just at the plant kingdom in general, how it first evolved. But the first plants that did evolve are seedless plants. And here you can see an image of these plants called horsetails. They're related to ferns and they are seedless so we will talk a little bit about what that is and then in chapter 26 we'll look at seed plants so I made some study objectives for you and there's some basically big concepts here and each one of these encompasses um, a group of things that you would need to know so we'll be looking at the challenges that land plants had to face as they uh, first adapted to life on land. The main relative of a land plant is um, an algae, particularly the kind of algae you might call seaweed. And we're going to uh, look at the evolutionary tree of the plants, showing the derived traits um, and that define the different clades. So that skill that you learned already is important for us here and you need to know that tree we will draw a really basic version of it and that'll be the one that you study and you need to know the terminology and sequence of something called the alternation of generations life cycle this life cycle is common to all land plants not only the seedless land plants but also the seeded land plants and then for this chapter in particular, we'll look at the scientific and common names of some groups of seedless plants and some products of economic value that come from these groups. So this is how your textbook kind of represents the land plants. The land plants go by the name embryophytes, and but I usually just call them the land plants. The, if you look at this drawing, I, this is kind of a top-down evolutionary tree, which I never draw a top-down evolutionary tree. If I turn this on its side, we would have the root of the tree, and this would just be the part of the evolutionary tree for the plants. The root is here, and then there's a split. And the ancestor, oops, not that. The ancestor is some kind of algae. And the main algae that is closest related to the land plants is called a caraphyte. Now, caraphyte is a modern algae, but it's kind of the basal taxon, probably simil most similar to the common ancestor. There are other types of algae, but caraphyte is a green algae, which uses chlorophyll as its pigment, one of its main pigments. There are other types of algae. There are brown algae, which are present. I'll put another branch up here. Brown algae, there's red algae. But those are not as closely related to the land plants. So brown and red algae are also algae. And they have different kinds of pigments. So green is not the only color of pigment that can be used for photosynthesis. But for whatever reason, because land plants evolved from an ancestor that had the green pigment primarily, then that's why land plants are primarily green. All right, so these are, I'm gonna put land plants down here. Okay, so this is really going back to kind of where um, it all began. It's some kind of algae that's like a seaweed type algae. Oops, seaweed. If you ever go to the ocean, you can see big pieces of this wash up on the beach. Seaweed, that's an, actually an algae. There's also a unicellular algae that makes kind of a scum on the top of a, of a pond, but that's a little more distantly related to the land plants. So in any case, we're going to be looking at the land plants. In chapter 25, we're going to look at the seedless, these two groups here. And then in chapter 26, we'll look at the seeded ones, okay? So land plants evolved from 
an ancestor that was a green algae, probably similar to modern day caraphyte. And, but then they moved on to land and they adapted to life on land. The problem with living on land is water. That's gonna be true in the animal kingdom as well. Life evolved in the ocean first. So all organisms evolved first in the ocean, or at least our ancestors evolved in the ocean. And so there's a different issue with water if you live in the ocean versus if you live on land. Of course, the ocean is made of salt water, so there is some issue there. But when you're on land, there's just not enough water. That's always going to be the issue. So any adaptation to terrestrial life is going to need to involve any structures that protect the organism from desiccation. So memorize that word. That just means drying out. Um, structures that help the organism move water around. So we call that vascular tissue and vessels are inside of plants. They have vessels, just like you have vessels that move your liquids around inside of your body. Plants have vessels. And so these kinds of things are very um, important to life on land because life on land is dry. So getting water, keeping it, moving it around, these are very important adaptations. The other adaptation that's important to land plants is what we call dispersal, or the, one of the problems I should say with life on land is dispersal. And dispersal means spreading your offspring out, spreading out your offspring so that they don't compete with you for resources, spreading out your offspring. Because if a plant has offspring, but they grow right next to the parent plant, then pretty soon you're competing with your own offspring for light and water and nutrients from the soil. So dispersal will be favored in any situation, but in water, if you're in the ocean, dispersal is not such an issue because there's currents and the, the organisms can move away from each other just by floating in the water. And, but on land, it, it's a little more difficult um, to disperse your offspring. So we're gonna see some adaptations for dispersal of offspring. And part of that adaptation for dispersal comes with this life cycle. It's called the alternation of generations life cycle. All land plants have the alternation of generations life cycle. Okay. So all organisms that live on land, and plants uh, in this chapter, have some adaptations that help with desiccation. All of the land plants have the alternation of generations life cycle. And most of the plants have vascular tissue. So that one's just a most, not all. So this is all, this is all, this is most. Okay, the plants that have vascular tissue are called vascular plants. So that will be a clade. The vascular plants will be a clade. The types of vascular tissue, I don't know if you've learned this in another course, maybe in high school, but here I'm just telling you there's two types of vascular tissue. One's called xylem and one's called phloem. Xylem is made up of cells called tracheids. And they are actually dead cells that connect together and create kind of a hollow tube that moves water through the plant. And it's a very thin tube so that capillary action can move the water up from the ground up into, if the plant is tall, it can move all the way up. Phloem is made up of live cells that move glucose just simply by diffusion. So water will move by capillary action and um, there's a vacuum when, when water evaporates from a leaf, it creates a little bit of a vacuum that draws more water up the vessels. And then phloem moves glucose through living cells. Uh, the phloem are composed of living cells and glucose moves through the plant by diffusion. So these vascular tissues are only found in vascular plants, but a huge amount of plants are vascular. Now, what about this alternation of generations thing? 
When I took 1407 biology, my professor showed us a picture not unlike this picture, which was completely meaningless, and simply pointed to the different terms and then basically told us to read the book and then moved on to the next slide. And it was completely useless. I had no idea what this was. So what I've done is I've created what I call a script. And a script means you can repeat this over and over as you're looking at this picture or a similar picture and try to visualize what each of these things actually means and what's actually happening for a plant as it goes through its life cycle. The life cycle of a plant is not the same as the life cycle of an animal. So if you thought they were the same, then I'm going to teach you something new. The life cycle of a plant, part of the life cycle is made of a multicellular organism, multicellular diploid organism, 2N is short for diploid, and that plant is called the sporophyte. P-H-Y-T-E -E means plant, like an entire organism. Okay, but in the life cycle of a plant, there's also a multicellular plant that's haploid. And that plant is called the gametophyte. This is the thing that there is no equivalent in the animal life cycle. We don't have um, for the most part, uh, well, there are a few exceptions to this, but for most animals, there is no multicellular haploid organism. And so plants have two parts of their life cycle, two fully grown plants, two plants that one of them is made up of many diploid cells, and then there's a different one that's made up of many haploid cells. And so that's kind of odd, I would say. And so what I've done is I've created a script. I'm going to read through it once and kind of flip back to this picture and see if um, I can help you make sense of this. And then we'll go through the script again with, with another picture um, that actually shows some actual plants and you can start to get a sense of what these things really are. But I think we really first have to start with some definitions. Um, even if you're not 100% sure what, what it is you're memorizing, we start there and then we keep working on it. So this is the script. Oops. I usually start, since it's a life cycle, you can start anywhere, but I usually start at the diploid stage. All right. The whole plant at this stage of the life cycle is called the sporophyte. P-H-Y-T-E means plant. All the cells of the sporophyte plant are diploid. That means there's two copies of every chromosome in each cell. So you have, I don't know, pea plants have seven chromosomes. So two copies of the first chromosome, two copies of the second chromosome, all the way up to the seventh so each cell would have 14 chromosomes total. Now, within the plant, of course, the plant is made up of cells, and there are a group of cells that are kind of special, and they're called the sporocytes. C-Y-T-E means cell. So P-H-Y-T-E means plant, like organism. C-Y-T-E means cell, so you kind of got to pay attention to these um, suffixes or roots in the word. So there are a few cells in the sporophyte plant that are special. I mean, there's a lot of cells in the sporophyte plant, but there's a few cells that are called the sporocytes, and they're located within an organ. Yes, plants have organs, just like animals have organs. There are some cells called the sporocytes that are in the organ called the sporangium. So you're noticing that they all have this sort of prefix sporo. So the sporangium is an organ, the sporocyte is a cell, and the sporophyte is a plant. So 
I usually describe this as Russian dolls. I don't know if you know what Russian dolls are. Have you ever seen these dolls? Oh, you know, I'm not going to draw it well. And they, they're made of wood, usually, and you can open them. When you op take this one off, there's another one inside of it. And then that one, you can, that one, when you take this one off, there's another one inside of it kind of thing. Okay. So the organism is the sporophyte. Within the sporophyte somewhere, there's an organ, which is smaller than the organism. And within the organ, there are cells. Okay, so one within the other. So sporophyte, the biggest, sporangium, the organ, sporocyte, the cells. Okay, I'm going to go back to the other page. So here's the sporophyte. This circle is supposed to be the sporophyte. Lots of cells inside of it. And then here they've, they've drawn a little circle. I don't know if you can see it. That's supposed to be the organ called the sporangium. So somewhere within the sporocyte, excuse me, sporophyte, is the sporangium, which is an organ. And within the sporangium are the individual cells, which are the sporocytes. So one within the other, like Russian dolls. OK? OK, so we've kind of got that set up. So. What happens next is, the, at some point, the sporocytes, which are diploid right now, go through meiosis. That's a cell division. And each sporocyte becomes a haploid cell, actually four. I guess each sporocyte would make four haploid cells. And those haploid cells now are called spores. So the sporocytes are still inside the sporangium, and the sporangium is still inside of the sporophyte plant. But now, after meiosis happens, then now what's inside the sporangium are haploid cells. So the spores are haploid, but they're inside the sporangium, which is made of diploid tissue. And the sporangium is still part of the sporophyte plant. And then what happens is the sporangium, that organ, opens. So the sporangium is usually at the surface of the plant. It's an organ, but it can open and release the spores. And the spores leave the sporophyte plant. The spores leave the sporangium, and therefore they leave the sporophyte plant. OK, so then what happens to the spores? Each spore, it starts here really, the spore is released from the sporangium. So this is a continuation of the last slide. Hopefully, if all goes well, it lands somewhere. I wrote moist soil. That would be a good a good outcome. If it lands on moist soil or water or something, it can grow. It can germinate. And it divides, that means it divides by mitosis. And mitosis makes clones. So one haploid cell can become a whole bunch of haploid cells. Because mitosis makes cells that are identical. And then you have an entire plant eventually. And that plant, which grew, just from one spore, is called the gametophyte. So the haploid plant that grows from a spore is called a gametophyte. And the gametophyte is the plant. And inside the gametophyte, there's an organ called the gametangium. And inside the organ, there are cells. And so the gametophyte plant, 
contains an organ called the gametangium, and the gametangium contains cells. And I don't know why we don't, I don't, they're not really called gametocytes, although that's kind of what they would be called, I think. But those cells inside the gametotangium will go through a mitosis now, what we call the special mitosis, and they create the gametes. So even though all the cells in the gametophyte are haploid, only the cells inside the gametangium can form the gametes. And the gametes are the ones that are able to fuse to make the next organism. That's called fertilization. So if the gametes that are formed are sperm, they will actually leave their organ. So we call it the male gametangium. If the um, cells, if the gametes that are formed are female, they're eggs, then they stay inside the female gametangium. So here there's a little bit of a difference. The sperm will leave the male gametangium. The eggs will stay inside the female gametangium. So that means you have two different organs. You have a male gametangium, a male organ, where male gametes form, and you have a female organ where the female gametes form, so sperm and eggs. We still use the words sperm and eggs. And when a sperm meets with an egg, they fuse, and that's called fertilization. So fertilization is where the two cells fuse. Fertilization is the opposite, conceptually, the opposite of a cell division. Fertilization is where two cells fuse together, not one cell splitting into two. So it's where the sperm and the egg fuse like two bubbles, like two soap bubbles fusing together, and their nuclei fuse. So when each of these, each sperm is haploid, each egg is haploid, so when one sperm and one egg fuse, the new organism, the new cell here, which is called the zygote, is diploid. And that guy is going to grow, the diploid zygote is going to grow into the next sporophyte plant. All right, so I'm going to take a break, and I think you should take a break at this point, and go back through this script several times to... Um, practice and to try to quiz yourself on this terminology because it can be quite confusing.